welcome to uh, module two, video two, uh, in our uh, guide to applying a multi-criteria decision-making framework. And as we said, a very practical guide uh, that we are undertaking here. And in this video, we really want to look at the really key issue when we are using AHP, because you need to get it right from the beginning. And that's really about how you structure your problem. So what we're going to do in this video is consider the process of structuring our multi-criteria decision-making problem. And we're going to do this using the example of the work in New Zealand that we discussed uh, in an earlier framework and which much of the reading um, considers. So in particular, we're going to look at how we chose the domains and subdomains, really identify what we mean by subdomains and domains, of course, as well and what needs to be considered when you select them. So again, just to go back a little bit, let's think about what we were trying to do in New Zealand, as this drives our choice of criteria, what we call domains, and sub-criteria, what we call subdomains. And again, that's really you know, a key issue. What is it you're trying to do? Because that then really will determine what criteria are important to you. Remember, uh, one example we uh, were highlighting was how close or how well um, the characteristics of the next generation systems fitted with the land manager motivations and perceptions. So that was one of the ways we, we could use our, our tool, wasn't it? So we needed to think about what is important to land managers and then think about how the characteristics of the next generation systems fitted this because we're in within our overall framework that we were looking at here our idea about whether or not a new system will be adopted will depend upon how well this new system compared to the old system here basically enables farmers to react to external incentives price signals policy instruments etc and in the sense how well it fits with what they want, what their land can do, do you know, what's, what's the capability of their land. And again, and then if the characteristics fit very closely with this and match their land, then we're likely to lead to adoption as well. So this was you know, a key driver of what we were looking at in, in, our, in our analysis. And we go forward a little bit, you know, we showed, didn't we, that then we can identify these next generation systems. And in our example, we use the uh, example of dairy sheep. We then can identify the criteria that are important, the environmental, financial, etc. We can see how well our dairy sheep perform against that. And then we can weight those, depends how important farmers found or land managers found those individual criteria to get a weighting for it and see how well it fitted. And so we did this, didn't we, as we said, with two uh, dairy sheep, um, potential people considering dairy sheep with two land managers, and we were able to score the system that way. Now, that's one way we can use it, which is really about uh, weighting alternative systems and seeing how well they fit with the weights generated by the land manager, really. Or we can use it a different way. And this is probably what more I'm going to talk about in this video is we can just use it to just consider, well, what is important to their managers? How much weight do they put on these different criteria? And because that gives an indication of, you know, again, you know, what's important to them, what factors they're considering, and that can allow us um, to think about a whole range of uh, issues like we talked about at the end uses of this model. And so we're going to talk more really about this level, not so much about matching it and comparing different systems in this. So we're really just thinking about using it to help us consider what's important to the land manager. So we talked about this idea of domains and subdomains. So I think it's good for us to go back into some more detail. We just touched on this briefly in our earlier video. So first of all, what are domains and subdomains and what's the difference between them and then really why do we use them so what we call domains 
you know, they're really what high level overarching categories um, that may be important in decision making. So if you're deciding about a new land use, you would be considering its overall financial performance. You will be considering what it does in terms of environmental performance. You may be thinking about markets, about what knowledge is available. These are the high level criteria that are important to you. And we call those the overarching domains, yeah? Now, clearly within those domains, there are a whole range of other factors that may be important. And these are what we call the subdomains or others may call sub criteria. So, you know, simple example, within the financial domain, you may be concerned particularly about the return on investment or the payback period or the profitability per hectare. So there are a range of criteria, sub-criteria that fit within that higher domain, um, the financial domain. So why do we kind of break it down into this domain and subdomain level? First of all, by structuring the problem this way, we keep it manageable. Um, so we can do analysis at the higher level and then go down into each of those domains into more detail, the subdomains into more detail. As I said, it helps us structure the problem um, in, in, a, in a sort of structured, logical way. It also allows us to delve deeper into the decision-making process. If we stay at the higher, higher up domain, the financial, okay, we can say, yes, from that we know financial is important, but we don't know what aspect of financial is really important to them. Is it the amount of capital they have to spend or is it the return on this investment they get? Because again, that could have important um, implications for decision-making. You know, a particular uh, factor may perform overall well financially. So you say, well, they should choose it, but actually within those sub-criteria, there may be something key that doesn't fit with what the land manager is looking for. So, you know, the overall thing is, okay, so financial is important, but what aspect of financial is driving it? So the key thing then is, you know, because this is so fundamental to structuring the problem, because this is what you're going to get uh, your uh, respondent, uh, your interviewee, the pairwise comparisons are going to be between these domains and these uh, uh, criteria in the subdomains too, then it's really important to be able to identify what are the right ones for your particular problem. So how do we determine? So clearly we're not starting ever from new, um, basically, there's been a lot of literature on lots of decision making processes. So I think, you know, you know, we go back to the literature and see, you know, if people in our example are thinking about changing land use, what factors are important to them. But then there's also value in uh, brainstorming. Um, you can do this as a bigger group or maybe even just a couple of you uh, within our, our, our analysis. You know, I spent, a, a, you know, we locked ourselves in a room with a colleague and spent an hour or two. Um, just trying to work out, you know, which were the important criteria in this. And but obviously more importantly, well, not more importantly, but, you know, also importantly is discussing with the stakeholders in the sense of the people you're going um, to speak to or people that have an interest in this, you know, again, because they will have uh, insight. So through this process, you can begin to identify, you know, the criteria that are likely to be important in the decision-making uh, context that you're looking at. And that's exactly uh, what we did. Now, the question is, well, how many criteria or domains and subdomains do you need? And of course, first of all, this will depend upon what you're looking at. And again, but there's a few things we should consider. Um, how many domains will we use? So how many of the high level domains? In our example, we use six. Um, how many alternatives will be in each domain? And again, there's a challenge, a practical, a pragmatic situation here. You know, basically, you need enough of these indicators, these criteria to be comprehensive, that you can capture the key elements of the decision making process that's going on. But you also need few enough to make it 
manageable in an applied situation. Because the more the uh, criteria you put into your analysis, the more pairwise comparisons they have to make under AHP. So basically, you know, you are then putting more pressure on your respondent, put more time pressure on them, and maybe it's hard for them to concentrate, you know, focused all that time. So there's a trade-off, you know, there's a trade-off between being comprehensive, capturing the essence of that decision-making, um, but at the same time, not having so many that actually it's virtually impossible to do the analysis. And one of the questions you know you have to think about it's a pragmatic question is how long are you likely to have with the person you're interviewing as i said roughly we had six domains and six sub criteria in each domain okay so it's like six in each subdomain um, so basically or six subdomains so that when we did this, this took anywhere between one and three hours to complete, depending in a sense how chatty, how engaged the respondents were. So basically the more domains and the more alternatives within it, then the longer it takes and the greater the challenge to keep them engaged. Um, but at the same time, the more domains, the more you're likely to capture that breadth, complexity of the decision um, making process. Now, we should emphasize that, you know, we used domains and then went down to the subdomain level. It, you know, AHP is very flexible and, and can, it's perfectly possible just to keep it, depending on what you're trying to do at that high level. You know, is it financial that's driving these people or is it environment? Because that gives us insights that can help us with choice of land uh, ma management or ex expanding land like in the Sentinel project, okay? In that project, you know, time and resources were limited. The researchers were generally new to using AHP and therefore they kept it at this higher level. And within that, you can simply document when they're talking about financial or environment, what are the actual subdomains or sub criteria they're considering? So they could be talk when they're talking about financial, they could be talking about profit per hectare. And you know that that's an important driver. You don't necessarily have to quantify it, but it gives you insight. So that has advantages, doesn't it? This idea of staying at the higher level. It's simpler, much less time consuming, and you don't need to think classify the factors quite so much ahead of the interview. You don't have to specify what those subdomains are. You allow them to do that as they discuss. The disadvantage is that maybe it gives us less understanding of the trade-offs and a little bit less understanding of the decision making of what really is the crucial aspect of this decision making process but maybe it's a good first step to do, uh, you know in that process of talking about those high level domains and what's important within them to identify subdomains that could be used in future uh, analysis or approach so if we go back to the example that we use, as I said, we came up with six domains. And then within those six domains, we had on the average, mainly most times six subdomains. And we you know, identify this a lot through the literature, um, through um, discussion, et cetera. So our six domains are financial performance, market, knowledge, regulations, social, and environment. And then for example, in environment, we found that in New Zealand context, the nitrogen leaching, quality of water, phosphate losses, diseases, greenhouse gas, gas emissions, and broader environmental stewardship were important factors that farmers or land managers took in. And so these became you know, uh, domains and subdomains. Domain environment, the overall criteria environment, subdomain, subcriteria, nitrogen leaching, water quality, et cetera. Okay, and we can structure it this way. So the blue up here are high level domains, and then under that are subdomains within that process. So how do we, you know, sort of structure that problem? What does it mean in terms of how we do things? Okay. So practice, in, you know, AHP in our analysis was conducted within three stages. 
So fundamentally, to begin with, we worked at that domain level, uh, comparing financial against environment, financial against market, financial against social, et cetera, et cetera, environment against social, environment against financial, you know, and, and down, down, down through our, uh, our analysis. So basically, we just did that at that high level. And that generated overall weights. So that gives us an overall weight of how important environment is, environmental factors, financial factors as well. So for example, uh, environmental factors may come out at uh, 0.2 or 20% weight in that situation. Then what we do is apply within the same analysis within each of the criteria. So within financial, we would then go through and compare how important is the level of capital investment required against the return on investment. How important, for example, is the return of investment against the payback period. And again, you will generate weights um, to highlight that. So then within that overall domain, you know how much weight they're giving to those particular sub-criteria, sub-domains, okay? And then the final stage, is to weight the criteria at those subdomain levels you've got by the overall weight that you've given to financial, okay? So this, I mean, sometimes it's a little hard to follow. Let's just be specific here. So if we did the first analysis at domain and we found that the weight for the financial domain was 0.5 or 50% of the weight given to decision-making went to financial. And then we found that when we went to the subdomain level, that the weight given to return on investment was also 0.5, then or 50% given to it. This would mean that the overall weight for return on investment in our overall final decision-making would be 0.25. So it's the 0.5 that we've given to the financial multiplied by the 0.5 that we've given for return on investment in that. And that means that weights for individual criteria can go from zero if no weight's been given to it at all, to one, if it's actually the sole determinant of our analysis. But what it does show us is, you know, within a criteria, the weights are being weighted by how important we give, we view that criteria. So the overall weights that come into return on investment are in part determined by how much weight we've given to financial in this example. So let's just take a real example again to highlight um, what happened here. So we went through the process. And again, remember these weights will add up to one. I should have summed it here. Sorry, I didn't. So in this case, with this person, we found financial performance had a weight of 0.375 out of one, market factors 0.16, social well-being, et cetera. Okay, so we see financial performance here. Then when we went into the subdomains within financial performance, these were the weights that were generated. So for example, payback period was given quite a high weight here, 0.326, right? So then how do we work out the, the importance of these in the overall decision-making process? We simply weight this figure by the overall weight given to financial. And this comes out, and I've expressed it as a percentage here because it's easier for us to see. So it's 2%, but as we see, payback period was higher and about 12%. But once we've summed these, it's 37.54, which is the same as 0.37.54, you know, rounded to five, is the same weight as that. So these sub-criteria will add up to that overall weight that we've given to financial through this process. So just to highlight um, something uh, of importance to us is the subdomains need to be described to respondents in a way that can be sure that they interpret correctly what is being considered. And this is a really key thing. What we, you think is a criteria, they need to also realize it's the same criteria when they understand it. So if you're talking about quality of life, for example, which is one of our social criteria, what does, you know, make sure that they understand it in the same terms that you mean it, yeah? Or culture or other, other factors that, yeah? And again, 
we also need to make sure you know that we understand the way they've interpreted them when they are feeding back to you and it might be depending on how you're using it it might not be you know it might it might be more important that you understand how they've interpreted it and what they're talking about when you write it up for them okay but if we're trying to maintain consistency across a group for comparison then we need to make sure that they've interpreted it the same yeah and so the other thing we need to do is give careful consideration to what's within each domain and whether respondents can make meaningful comparison between the options. You know, they've got to be able to trade off. So they need to be able to make reasonable comparison within the financial or the environment. And we can think about this again in terms of our consistency. Uh, levels, our consistency ratios that we found. So, for example, if we look at environmental here, we found perhaps the highest levels of consistency in the decisions that were made within that domain. Farmers were consistently able to indicate that nitrogen leaching, for example, was more important than phosphate, or that phosphate was more important than um, greenhouse gas emissions, etc. And that's because the criteria were quite tightly defined. You know, it was nitrogen, phosphate, et cetera. And farmers were able, land managers were able to sort of trade that off. If we look at the market uh, one in um, as a comparison or in contrast, we see the levels of consistency we made there were slightly lower. And I think that's because they were trying, we had much broader characteristics like security of supply, like overall scale of the market. And I think it, land managers found it harder to consistently trade off those things because they're quite big and a little bit divergent. So all I guess we're trying to make here is what's within those domains is important. And also you've got to think about not just what's important to decision making, but can people logically compare them so that they can, in a sense, rank them in their minds about how important they are to you. So again, this came back to the point, just re-emphasizing it here. Yeah. You know, about consistency and inconsistency. You know, if we if basically we have inconsistency, it might mean that overall they aren't able to grasp the concept of trade-off, okay? So again, that's that's not so much your choice of subdomains and domains, it's mean about the whole process, yeah? But what's important to us is, you know, this idea that I just mentioned, if the subdomains are poorly constructed, for example, if the factors are too disparate, too different, then it may be difficult for respondents to consistently um, compare them. And that could be a key challenge to us. The final thing about consistency um, is that, you know, if there's simply too many comparisons to be made, we've got too many domains and subdomains, basically your respondents are gonna become fatigued. They're just gonna start moving your dial one way or the other just to try and get rid of you so they can get on with whatever they have to do. They're very busy people running their businesses. Um, so again, the second and third ones really matter about the. So this one is about the number of domains and subdomains you have could lead to inconsistency if you have too many. And this one is about how you construct those. So again, it is very important about that process. But what I just want to emphasize again in summary is structuring the problem is crucial to success in applying your MCDM. We need to identify the key elements of the decision-making process you are looking at what's important for this particular uh, aspect that you're looking at. You need to think about structuring it in terms of what are high level, i.e. financial, and what are the lower level, the subdomains, the subcriteria, return on investment, capital requirements, etc. And again, we're really trying to be comprehensive, but pragmatic that we can't capture every aspect of it. In our next video, um, we're going to move on from this to say how we took the principles of AHP and developed a tool based in an Excel spreadsheet um, for New Zealand and uh, for, analysis, uh, for analysis in New Zealand and highlight how it can be 
actually undertaken. And in that, we will again go over some of these key elements of what you need um, to be you know, confident on before you get to this stage. Um, again, there's some reading available um, based on this video. Um, so basically as a systematic review of the criteria used in AHP, and this can help um, you think about how criteria are being defined and measured. And again, for our particular case, um, reading um, from module one on uh, the, the framework for prioritizing innovation will give you some insights about the selection of uh, criteria or domains in this. Uh, again, just want to acknowledge um, that the part of the work on New Zealand was funded through our Land and Water National Science Challenge. And hope you enjoy the, radio, uh, the reading materials and look forward to seeing you in the next video.